Okay. Hi everyone. Uh, I'm Liat. I will talk today about uh, unsupervised models explanations and evaluate, evaluating explanations. I'm a PhD student at the Department, the Department of Software Information Systems Engineering at Bangalore University. One of my uh, the master students that work with me sitting here in the course, we work together on uh, causal learning. Uh, my supervisors are Professor Bracha Shapira and Professor Leo Rokach. So first, a little bit about myself. Um, so I will talk today about uh, explaining anomalies. So I think that also my career path is a little bit of anomaly. So I did my BSc in the same department. And then I was traveling for 14 months in South America. And then in the, uh, Thailand, I was working in a diving uh, center as a dive master. Then I came back to the university for my master studies. My uh, thesis was about intention prediction. Um, together with working in the Deutsche Telekom labs in Bangalore University. While doing my master studies, I also did a Skype skipper license together with my husband, and then we bought a boat. And when I finished my master studies, we went out sailing. Uh, so we sailed uh, from Israel to the Caribbean islands on a sailing boat. And I remember that when I was sitting uh, in a night shift in the boat um, while crossing the Atlantic Ocean, I was thinking to myself how we can use machine learning to improve weather prediction, weather forecast. Then came back to Israel. We lived on the boat for three years. And uh, I started working in Verint as an NLP researcher. And after four years, I decided to go back to the university, not yet for a PhD, but I started to work with uh, as a um, data science um, project uh, lead uh, in uh, some uh, cooperation of Bellevue University with some uh, other companies. So I worked with uh, Audi, for example, and for KBC, which is a bank in Belgium and more. When I was working for in the project with the uh, Audi, we developed an unsupervised model for them to detect anomalies. And we gave the, anom the anomalies list to the domain experts, and uh, it was hard for them to understand why this event is anomalous. And in that time, I also, uh, by accident, I heard the podcast about shock. It was just invented about five years ago, and it all connected for me, and I decided to start to try to use shock for uh, explaining the anomalies to the people in Audi. And after a while, I, I understood that this field of explainable AI is very interesting because it connects the data from one side and the users from the other side. And this is what I like. So I decided to start my PhD. So today we'll talk about uh, explaining uh, anomalies detected by autoencoders using SHAP, which is a research I uh, had uh, in my PhD. And then about explanations evaluation, which is a topic that I think that um, people don't talk about enough. So uh, this is my research. It was published in a nice journal, Expert Systems with Applications, uh, last year. I will start with explaining what is an uh, autoencoder. So autoencoder is an uh, unsupervised uh, model, machine learning, deep learning model that is, uh, has a symmetric structure. And the goal is to train the model in a way that the inputs will be equal to the outputs. So it can be used to detect anomalies because most of the data that we have is normal. So we train the, the model to reconstruct the normal instances exactly uh, as they are in the input. And then if we have anomalies, they are not reconstructed well because this model is supposed to, to represent the normal instances. Now, I know that you learned in this course about CHAP, so I will not uh, talk a lot about how it's working, but you know that it's an additive feature attribution method. It's based on game theory, has a very sound theoretic uh, 
Um, and that's why people really like to use it. So it assigns for each feature an importance value, uh, the value and the direction, actually. So what do we have when we use autoencoder? We have the model after we trained it, and then we, get, we have new instances. We predict these instances through the autoencoder. And then we have a construction error, which is usually MSC. So uh, what, where are the anomalies here? The anomalies are here, okay, in the say, because these are the instances that were reconstructed well. So the MSC is close to zero. So the most interesting ones for us are these instances, and these are the ones we want to explain. So um, we have, like I said before, a list of uh, instances. We all we sort them by the most anomalies with the highest uh, MSC to the uh, least uh, anomalous one, and we want to explain the top something. Depends on the company, depends on the problem. So usually for explaining uh, very common, people use CHAP. But CHAP is used for supervised learning. And here we have an unsupervised model. So I wanted to use it anyway. And I thought about a way to do it. So we have the MSC, the reconstruction error of all these events one event, for example, with, with a higher construction error. But this reconstruction error is the sum of, of errors of all the features. So I decided to take the errors that were, that had the highest reconstruction errors from all the features in the event, explain them. So what we did is, for example, my three top features with high uh, construction are uh, uh, x3, 6, and 8. So each time I treat the, um, this model as, unsupervised, as a supervised model for the feature that I want to explain. If I want to know what happened in x3, why the construction error is so high between x3 and x3, so what I do is I treat it as a supervised learning supervised model that the, the inputs are the same and the output is only X3. And now I can use SHA. And I do the same for X6 and for X8. And so I have for each feature with the higher construction error, I have the list of features that most affected it. Um, it's true that the model uh, in, a, in that way, the SHA doesn't know that the inputs are equal to the outputs. Um, but for me, it's okay. Most of the time, we, we don't see, I mean, in my experiments, I didn't see that it, X3 affects X3. It's the other features that affected him. We also tried to like eliminate this one, the X3, but the results were around the same. So for example, here for X3, I find that X1, 2, 5, and 10 has the highest Shapley values. So as, as I said before, as you all know, Shapley values has also direction. It's not just value. So what I want to, to do now is to, since I explain anomalies, I want to split the, um, the, the sharp values, the features with the highest sharp values to the ones that contribute to the anomaly and the one that offset the anomaly. What do I mean by that? If I have for x3, the real value was one and the predicted value is 0 0.01. So the one that contrib contribute to the anomalies are the one that pushed the direction is towards the 0 0.01. These are the ones that contribute to the anomaly. Uh, the, uh, the, the ones that contribute, that push to one, to the value one, are the one that offsets the, the anomaly for each feature with a higher construction error. So eventually what we can do is present it like this. For example, in Audi, we presented it like this because it helped them to understand the issue. For example, they have a, we have a problem with the same motor and this uh, uh, 
the motor exists in the warranty claim and it should not be. I mean, the reconstruction is zero, so it should not be the reconstruction in the um, warranty claim. Why? Because another, uh, for example, X5 uh, is supposed to be in the warranty claim, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't, okay? So the mechanic made the wrong decision, for example, in this case. So th they wanted to show it, to see it separately, but we can also make a list of uh, features for the whole uh, event, <laughs> the contribute anomaly and the offset anomaly. Now, um, now I want to talk about evaluating explanations. Um, and then I will go back to how I evaluated my uh, research. So before we start, we talk about how to um, evaluate the explanations. I want to mention that we have different users to the explanation. So one user is the end user, like uh, a bank, a bank um, seller, something like this, or uh, we have data scientists that want to improve their models. We have uh, decision makers like doctors, for example, and we have regulatory agencies. And for each one of them, there is a different goal in the explanations. And the evaluation of the explanations should be according to the users and to the explanation goals. Uh, so some of them want to understand the predictions, for example, the decision makers, and also the data scientists, they want to, to understand what's going on in the uh, predictions. Uh, model verification, I have an example for this, and we'll show you in a second. Uh, model debugging, for example, for data scientists that want to make sure that their model is uh, correct or why it's not correct, so how to improve it. Uh, can, we can do uh, error analysis, the model using explanations, the goal of, uh, I think, all the users is to increase the uh, trust uh, so they can really uh, use this system. So this is an example for model verification. It's very, uh, I don't know if you showed it in the course. They know it. OK, so I, what? Okay. OK, so model uh, verification. Right. Um, so this is a very uh, nice example that uh, usually people show in uh, CI courses or lessons. Uh, here the, they train the classifier. It's from the paper about Lyme from 2016. Uh, so they train the classifier to identify whether uh, this image is a wolf or husky. And the model was very accurate, very, very accurate. But then, they wanted to check why in places that it's wrong, why is it wrong? So they saw in this picture that the predicted, uh, the model is predicted wolf, but the, the true uh, picture is a husky. And when they used line to understand what are the uh, most important features that uh, made this decision that this is a wolf and not husky, they saw that it's the snow behind the animal because in all the wolf uh, pictures here, we have snow. So the model is correct, but not from the right reasons. Another thing about the uh, explanations is that we can, um, uh, they have many forms. We can present it like I showed before, like in, even in Excel, we can uh, highlight the uh, parts of the image. We can do it like a heat map. There are many ways to show it. This is also part of the evaluation. If it's uh, sometimes the, the evaluation is not about the correctness or about, about some metric of the um, explanation, but how people really understand the explanation. It's also uh, something important. So uh, we can split uh, that until three years ago, there were only 5% of the papers about uh, explainable AI talked about evaluation. In the last one or two years, it's, uh, it became more common, but still there is no um, like state-of-the-art paper about evaluating explanations. 
it's still an open question and, and in my opinion, very important and interesting. So we can split uh, like in, uh, in general, the explanations to two types, two types. One is usability, but usability evaluation does not take into account the content of the explanation. I will show you what it, it, it does take into, into account. And the other one is correctness. Uh, correctness considers only the content of the explanation and it, uh, we need ground truth for this. So usually we, we are used, not in unsupervised learning, but in supervised learning, in machine learning, we are used to have ground truth to, to test our models and we have metrics. It's very easy to know if we manage to improve an algorithm or not because we can check the AUC, the precision, recall, accuracy, whatever. It's very easy. In explanations, it's very difficult. We, we don't have ground truth almost always. We don't have it. So evaluating the correctness uh, of the explanation is very difficult. Some properties of um, um, usability um, um, evaluation of explanations is uh, soundness, for example, which is uh, to see if we, if the model, for example, if sharp says that a, a feature is, has the highest in, uh, importance in prediction, and then we remove this feature if we, really the prediction is changing a lot comparing to the other features. And also the opposite starts from like an almost empty model and then adds features uh, the same. So this is soundness. And the other one is robustness uh, to check how stable is the model. I will show you on my research in a moment. Uh, about how to measure the robustness. There are many more uh, usability evaluation features for explanation. We have, um, for example, consistency. Uh, if two uh, similar events have similar explanations, for example, uh, you can check also like in, um, not a, uh, like more about the, like what I said before about visualization, how people understand how interactive is the explanation, things like that. So what we did in our research about, I remind you, uh, we did uh, um, explanations for anomalies detected by autoencoders. So we wanted to see, uh, to compare sharp and line and see uh, which one of them is more robust. So we added, we had some data sets, we added noise features. What, when we add noise features, like from a, a, some distribution that should not affect the, anything actually. Um, so we want that the explanations will not include the noise features. This is the goal. Um, and we, we use the measure, a metric called the MRR. We want to see that the, we have a list of uh, explaining features. The noise features should be in the bottom. Uh, so sharp is the blue line and the line is the orange uh, line is the orange line. And you can see that in all cases for a different data set, sharp is better than line. Still, I remind that uh, it's not, um, it doesn't say anything about the correctness of the explanations. Just say that this one is more robust than the other one. It doesn't mean that the, the explanations are good. In the industry and also in the academia, people are using, for example, sharp or other uh, methods uh, without thinking about the evaluation of the explanations. Just they use it because it exists. Uh, we have more time. We have more time. Yeah, actually, that was it for me. Uh, if you want, I can continue talking about many things because it couldn't hide uh, some slides. But uh, I put for you a quote that I really like, related also to the C, but also in general. Um, go for it. Otal, you missed my introduction about sailing. So, uh, <laughs> anyone has questions? Talk about physical evidence in real life. 
real time. Uh, First of all, I forgot to mention that I used in this research a uh, kernel shop, which is uh, for, uh, for black box models and it takes more time. So it, it relates to a question that uh, it's not for real time, the kernel shop. And also the evaluation, some of it you can do, I think, um, quite quickly, but I think in general, it's not for online, it's for, like offline investigation uh, in general to know if the method that you use is good for you or not. I, I, I can't say if the method is accurate or understandable or something. You, you need to choose what you evaluate. But whatever you evaluate, you need to investigate if it's, this method is, is good for you or not. I heard that you talked about counterfactuals before. So sometimes counterfactuals is what you're looking for, sometimes sharp. And also within these methods, there are so many parameters you can uh, play with that uh, it's, it's really important to, to know what you're doing, I think. Um, and which, even within the sharp, for example, you can use three sharp or kernel sharp, and it gives you not, not the same results always. 